If you're trying to get better as a cinematographer and filmmaker, which I'm guessing you are if you're watching this video, then you probably already know that one of the best things you can do is study the greats. And when it comes to documentaries, there aren't many more powerful than last year's Oscar winner 20 Days in Mariupol. So in this video, we're going to break down the cinematography of this incredible film because there are some extremely valuable lessons in there that we can apply to become better DPs and even better filmmakers. So right off the bat, this video isn't going to be about the typical shoot at low apertures for blurry backgrounds or why primes are better than zooms type of stuff because if you've seen this movie, you know that that's not really the vibe. This isn't some slick technical spectacle with crazy lighting setups and full frame anamorphic glass. It's a gritty verite film about a city being invaded by a hostile army. And let me just say something out loud in case you're thinking this is a weird choice for a cinematography breakdown. This is not really a beautifully shot film in the normal sense. The camera work is really rough, there's not much in the way of sexy lighting, and the main lens they used is sold over the counter at Walmart. By a lot of metrics, this could even be seen as a badly shot film, technically speaking. But if you've seen it, there's no way you came out of the theater thinking, man, that movie was badly shot, because you'd be so caught up in how it made you feel. And since the only point of documentary cinematography is to support the feeling and the mood of the story, not just to be cool looking for its own sake, despite what the internet wants you to think these days, then I'd argue this is exactly the kind of thing we should be studying as documentary DPs. So what can we learn about cinematography from a doc wasn't really all that well shot? Well, it turns out a lot. So let's get into the first scene because I think it makes a super important point. So this beat takes place on day four of the Russian attack on the city, and it's mainly the filmmaker Mstislav Chernov, apologies if my pronunciation sucks, but he's following a group of Ukrainian soldiers as they get into position and look for the enemy. And let me just say real quick, this establisher is the right way to use drones in docks. Just a nice single wide to show where the scene is taking place, then get down on the ground for the rest of the scene. One and done, that's all you need. Don't lean on the drone instead of story just because it looks cool. Okay, so we're on the ground now and I'm not gonna pull any punches here. The footage is shaky, there's weird zooming everywhere. Uh, it seems very possible that the shutter is off the 180 degree angle and the lens looks way too digitally sharp for my taste, especially when it's zoomed in. And maybe right about now you're asking where the learning example is here because what are we supposed to take away from this shaky mess where it seems like the camera is pointed at at the ground half the time. Well, for me, this scene reminds me of a really important lesson that's just way too easy to forget these days. The gear is there to serve the story, not the other way around. And really quickly, this is not the same thing as gear doesn't matter because for this film, the gear mattered a ton. In fact, everything about the gear used was done intentionally to support the needs of the story, even at the expense of sacrificing some raw image quality. But first, what gear did the filmmaker use? From what I can tell online, the film was shot on an A7S III with a 24 to 240 lens and a 40 millimeter Voigtlander prime, and I'd be lying if I said the combo sticks out to me as particularly good looking. Some of the night stuff with the Voigtlander looks great, but it's hard to watch this scene and think, man, that's great framing and image quality. Let's just be honest. And if someone had called me about taking a job as a DP for something like this, I probably would have taken a very different setup. But again, this setup was entirely dictated by the story. Mstislav is a professional conflict photographer after all, so bringing a dedicated cinema body like the FX6 would have been tough because it can't also shoot stills. And because of the crazy nature of the environment and all the running around he had to do, he needed something extremely lightweight, hence bringing that sort of one mid-range zoom lens. Okay, so if that explains the practical side of the gear serving the story, what about the creative? Well, it might look very casually stitched together, but if you read any interviews on the process of making this movie, it's pretty obvious that a ton of thought went into how the mood and the feel of the project was built. Like like for example, they actually shot a bunch of sit down interviews that I'm sure had some really great sound bites in them, but when it came time to edit, they realized that the story was much better served by keeping the world contained to just the 20 days on the ground instead of coming in and out to go to the interviews. In the same way, the crazy frantic shots and just the overall roughness of the footage is what makes it feel the way it does. Like, would I ever recommend someone handhold a 240 mil lens while running across the street? No, definitely not. But does it work here? Yes, 100%, and it was all 
one service of the story. If this had been broken up by a bunch of talking headshots, I kind of think the immersion would have been ruined, and so for me, the filmmaker made the right choices. So the takeaway is that gear matters hugely, but that isn't the same as saying more expensive must equal better. It's all about what's going to work for the style you're going for and what you can practically get in and out of the location. So don't rush out for that Burano or FX6 or whatever. Take a beat and figure out how you're going to make the gear work for you and the story you're trying to tell. Now I will say that I would have loved to see what this talented photographer could have done with a slightly more cinematic setup, but that's why it's his Oscar winning film and not mine. On the flip side of that would be some of the bigger budget docs I've done that have really complex interview setups and super high quality expectations. And in that situation, this would not be a good kit at all. It's all relative and it's all situational. Sometimes an FX9 with cinema glass is the right tool for the job and sometimes an iPhone would be the better choice. It's all up to you as the cinematographer to make that call and then work with what you have. And if you do want to go deeper into how I approach shooting docs as a professional DP, this is probably a good time to mention that the doors are officially open as of today for my documentary cinematography course. Now, I know I've been talking a lot about this course lately, and I'm sorry if you're getting annoyed, but I made this thing to share everything I know about how to shoot docs like a cinematographer and not a videographer. And now it's grown to over 12 hours of practical lessons and a thriving members community. I'm not going to hijack this whole video promoting myself, but I really am proud of this course. And after working with hundreds of people at this point, I know for a fact that it's helped a ton of people level up their documentary cinematography. It's not open very often, and this is going to be the last intake of 2024, so if it sounds like something you're into, check out the link in the description and get in there before it closes again until next year. Okay, so moving on to the next scene, I want to start out by talking about something that doc DPs need to deal with all the time. And here we're not talking about a technical skill, but it's the kind of situation you'll likely have to confront if you want to shoot docs at a high level. So this beat starts out with an air raid hitting a different part of the city, and then we see a bunch of people fleeing before the camera eventually lands on this young guy pushing whatever's left of his stuff down a muddy road stacked on an office chair. It's brutal, like it's so sad, and you're still not really sure if the danger is over at this point. And then the stuff starts falling off the chair, into the dirt, and you just want someone to run out and help the guy. You might even be thinking, why isn't the guy holding the camera doing something? And that's the point I'm trying to make here. Because if you really want to tell some hard hitting, emotional, or even dangerous stories one day, the reality is you're going to have to film some uncomfortable moments. And sometimes part of your mind is going to tell you to drop the camera and get involved, just like you might feel watching this guy struggle. I don't know if I should keep filming or try to calm her down. Now, I'm not here to tell anyone what to do, and if you were ever in a situation like this, you'd have to make up your own mind, and there's really no right answer. But this scene was burned into my head for a long time after I saw it, and for me, it says everything you need to know about the danger, the frustration, the confusion, the helplessness that the civilians were feeling as their homes turned into a war zone. And to have that kind of impact, the filmmaker had to hold the camera and just sit there with it, which is not easy, believe me. Again, every situation is different, and I'm not saying you need to become numb to suffering and just film people without feeling anything, far from it. You need to be empathetic to do this job well, in my opinion. But the very best doc DPs out there have to make exactly this kind of decision all the time. Like last month, I was filming in a refugee camp in East Africa, and I had to film a young woman who was clearly in distress, I'll say, as she had kind of a rough encounter with the camp staff. I'm being extremely vague here, I know, but that's because the shoot is still in progress and I can't talk about it. But it honestly didn't feel great to just be watching this whole scene unfold through an LCD screen instead of standing up for her like I might have wanted to. But if I'd put the camera down and gotten involved, the whole moment would have gone away and the beat wouldn't have worked. And then what was even the point of being there in the first place? It's this really strange ethical dilemma with no right answer, but at the end of the day, I think the most impact you can have on a situation like this is to tell the story well. So I probably would have done the same thing as Mstislav here and held the shot. What would you have done? It's worth thinking about because if you shoot docs for long enough, it might just be the kind of choice you have to make one day. All right, so now let's talk about Verite coverage, because one thing this film does really well cinematography-wise is make you feel like you're right in the middle of the moment. And since, like we've said already, good documentary cinematography is about bringing you closer to the story, not crafting single pretty frames, it's worth talking about. So this scene is basically just one long run through the city behind enemy lines. It's really tense as you're sort of waiting for them to come under fire at any second, and as a viewer, you feel like you're part of it. So why is that? Well, for starters, the camera 
camera is very close to the action, which might sound obvious, but a surprising number of new shooters end up backing up to a more comfortable distance and then riding the zoom lens in and out to get close. But really good immersive coverage often happens from right up close, like I'm talking two feet away with a 24 mil type of close. So if you're trying to shoot Verite and it's not quite working, you might want to get closer and shoot wider. Now this sequence is pretty rough, there's no point in pretending otherwise. The camera is pointing all over the place, there aren't a ton of cutaways, and the rolling shutter is out of control. And let's just reflect for a second on how many people lost their minds over the Burano's rolling shutter. I mean, this mess won an Oscar, so maybe let's all relax a bit and focus on what matters rather than obsess over technical things that audiences don't really care about in the end. Anyways, all the technical flaws aside, have you noticed what the filmmaker isn't doing every seven to 10 seconds yet? He's not cutting. It's actually something I notice a lot in DPs learning how to shoot Verite. They tend to shoot in these really self-contained little clips, like finding a shot, counting to five, and then cutting and reframing, then repeating over and over again until at the end of the day, there are hundreds or maybe even thousands of nice little frames. And I'm not hating on nice frames, but by stop starting like that, most of the time you're likely leaving a lot of goodness on the table. When I've watched things back I've shot after a professional editor has put everything together, it's amazing how often and I see those little in-between moments are left in. All those times I'm finding my focus or I'm panning over to see someone's reaction, the micro moments that I don't even notice are sometimes what really makes the Verite feel immersive. Like imagine if this scene was full of cuts, like if every 10 seconds he'd stopped recording, reframed, and then rolled again. It would have been completely different and I think much less powerful. That's even the natural tendency for experienced DPs who spend more of their time on controlled sets. But I'd encourage anyone who wants to try out Verite to cut a lot less. Stay with the action, keep rolling, and cover the moment. It's all digital, so just throw away what doesn't work later, but don't force that decision on the edit now. Yeah, rolling 45 minute takes of a scene creates mountains of footage and Werner Herzog would hate me. This is impermissible, this cannot be done. But that's literally just the reality of doc a lot of the time in my experience. It's not a commercial where the editor gets a tight little bundle of slated takes and they choose from maybe three or four options. Docs can have shooting ratios of 50 to one, 100 to one, or or more. For my first feature that I directed and shot, we shot over 400 hours of footage for an 85 minute edit and sometimes that's just the way it goes. Werner Herzog just claims this is wrong and he shoots like six hours of footage for his final edit because he knows exactly what he wants ahead of time, but most of us aren't Herzog, including me. But getting back to the movie, this scene works because the camera is just there and rolling and all the imperfections just add to the mood. So for your next Verite scene, try to break the habit of constant cutting and instead think of covering a moment and flowing with the action and just roll until that moment is done. I think you'll find that you give yourself a lot more options in the edit and some of the messy parts actually become the stuff that takes your story to the next level. Okay, so the last thing I want to touch on is from this dark bunker scene, and specifically I want to talk about scene construction from the point of view of a DP, because there are pieces to this scene that, as a cinematographer, it's going to be your job to get. Beyond just the importance of having one low light prime in your kit for these dark situations, let's look at how this beat is put together. Now the central moment of the whole thing is this woman crying and talking about how she just wants to go back to her normal life and how she never wants to live under the control of Russia. This is the linchpin moment, but there's a whole scene built around around it and the cinematographer needs to make sure that the coverage is there for the editor to build it with. Like once we land in the bunker, there's this big wide shot to show the whole space. Audiences need to get a sense of the environment and that's why nearly all scenes have to start with some sort of establisher or it's really hard to settle in. Your brain always wants to know where are we? From there, the camera goes around the room for some textural moments to draw our attention to more specific details. There's a kid with a cut up forehead, the woman playing guitar, which also doubles as a shot to explain the source of the ambient noise in the room, and then the nursery full of babies. These three shots tell us a ton about this scene. This isn't the front lines, this is full of non-combatants and kids, the cut up forehead tells us life is rough, and the woman playing guitar is saying that there's still hope and defiance. Then we get into the real meat of it, what it's all building towards, that woman in the night scene as the candle dies. Now notice that even within the larger scene, this moment is bookended by the fire from the lantern. At the start it's just being lit, and at the end 
it's just dying, plunging them all into darkness inside that bunker. Every scene needs a beginning and an end, and as a DP, that's your job to find it visually. Also, as the woman is talking, there's cutaways that reveal more about the story, like a hand being held to show that they're all in this together. And in the end, we're left with a two minute beat with a beginning, a sense of place, an emotional revelation, details and texture that bring us into the world, and then an ending. And just like in fiction movies, docs are made up of many little scenes like this, not just a bunch of B-roll stitched together in slow-mo with an interview behind it. You couldn't use this incredible moment of the woman in the dark without building the context around her, and that's all on the DP to get that coverage. So as you're shooting, think. Do we have an establisher? Do we get a sense of the place? Do we have textures and details? Is there an ending? It's a lot to keep track of, but that's the gig and something you need to master to do it well. So check out this movie if you haven't already. It's a full on experience, I promise you. The cinematography is imperfect in so many ways, but that doesn't make it any less powerful and it's well worth studying. And check out the link in the description for the course if you wanna go even deeper into this stuff or if you're watching this video late and the doors are already closed, jump on the waitlist to get notified next time it's open. See ya. Thank you.